So, uh, good afternoon. <coughs> this is the last lesson of the uh, first part of the course uh, on the epistemological basis of science. And we'll discuss the thinking of Thomas Kuhn, um, who in 1962 uh, published The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. It's a uh, small book that you can actually read. I would not suggest you to read the Popper's uh, uh, book, uh, which we talked about uh, last time, because that's a heavy and thick one. This one is uh, far more agile, and it's, uh, it's interesting to read if you ever had a chance. So, Thomas Kuhn was a physicist by training, who, during his life, uh, was involved in, in teaching the history of science which he himself had not been trained for. So, he studied uh, the history of science, of science himself and eventually developed uh, his views about the way uh, in which science evolves, which are uh, shown here. Most people at Kuhn's, uh, at Kuhn's times thought that science uh, uh, progressed linearly by accumulation of knowledge. Many people would still uh, say so today. Uh, maybe they're right, but who thought otherwise? So, in this simple view, science simply accumulates knowledge, and every piece of knowledge uh, adds up to form the, the, the body of science, which is uh, forever increasing. But Kuhn thought that, uh, uh, that such progress, uh, the progress of science, is not so uh, linear and it, it, it is, uh, most importantly, not so smooth. Meaning that he thought that science uh, progressed with ups and downs. He thought that at any given time there is a uh, current paradigm. We are going to uh, define a paradigm in emotion. And until that paradigm reigns, we are in a period of normal science. So let's stop here for the moment and talk about the paradigm which is central to uh, Kuhn's thinking. A paradigm can be defined as a uh, interpretive frame that is, a general idea of a sector of science, usually a large sector of science, which general idea frames the sector and provides the meaning to explain everything. Everything we observe in that sector of science is explained by the current paradigm. I'll give you uh, examples uh, in a few minutes. It so happens that every once in a while, science is shaken by crisis. The crisis, of course, when there is an accumulation of observations which do not fit the paradigm. Now, notice the first difference with Kuhn, uh, with, with Popper, sorry. Uh, Popper thought, on a logical basis, that one single observation contrary to the current theory would make that theory fall. Because, as I've just said, Popper, uh, uh, Popper uh, uh, gave uh, uh, um, sorry. Uh, Popper's view of science was logical. While Kuhn's ideas are rather uh, based on, uh, on the sociology, on the psychology, and on the history of science. Whence the differences, which, well, we will discuss it here. So, what is a crisis according to Kuhn? It's, again, an accumulation of facts, observations, 
that uh, cannot be explained within the current paradigm. This causes a crisis which throws the scientists, or at least the scientists that uh, work in the sector, affected in, uh, in despair, in a way, in, uh, in disarray, in, uh, in a temporary inability to uh, give a sense to their field. Then there is a revolution from which a new paradigm stems. So the revolution consists in elaborating and then accepting a new paradigm, under which we can have another period of normal science and so on. So, in a way, this resembles Popper, uh, Popper thinking, in that Popper thought that theories succeeded one another whenever a single observation was contrary to the theory. Here, um, Kuhn says the paradigm succeed one another uh, whenever there is a crisis and, and then a revolution from which a new paradigm is born. Now, what is normal science? Uh, normal science is science that is uh, guided by the current paradigm, meaning that not only scientists um, interpret their observations, their data, the results of their experiments, according to the paradigm. Which I, I'll repeat it because it's critical. It's an interpretive frame. So it, it is necessary for the scientists to interpret their data. They also design uh, experiments and observations according to the paradigm. They expect what the paradigm predicts so design observations and experiments according to the expectations. And so when the expectations are betrayed by reality, then the paradigm falls. I hope this is clear enough, but uh, we'll go straight into examples, and I, I think that we will uh, clarify further these concepts. Well, uh, these are examples cited by Kuhn himself. Uh, the first one is a very famous one. The uh, passage from Ptolemy's, in Italian Ptolemy, uh, Ptolemy's uh, uh, geocentric, geocentric uh, model of the universe, in which the Earth was in the middle of the universe, to the uh, heliocentric, heliocentric uh, figure of the universe, uh, according to Copernicus uh, and astronomers uh, after. So, uh, this is one first example of paradigm shift in which we had a, uh, a paradigm according to which the observations should be the observations. Uh, and we are talking about observations here because in astronomy we cannot do experimentation. Uh, the observations should be interpreted in the light of the Earth being in the middle of the universe. So, astronomers were forced to interpret whatever they saw in the sky according to this paradigm. While eventually Copernicus superseded this, this view and put the, uh, the sun in the middle of the, what was called then the universe, which we now rather call the solar system. So, of course, planets. Satellites, the sun itself, were moving the same way before and after Copernicus. So the observations were not disputed. There were, the observations were the same before and after Copernicus, and before and after Ptolemy. What differed drastically was the interpretations that, uh, that were drawn from these observations. Another uh, quite famous but probably less uh, well understood paradigm shift is that of gravitation. So in the, uh, in the beginning of the 18th century, Isaac Newton really uh, made history, one of the greatest uh, discoveries in history, 
physics. He devised the uh, universal law of gravitation, according to which the movements of, uh, of the stars and planets uh, of the satellites and two satellites of the time of the planets in the solar system could be not only explained but also calculated with immense accuracy. Something really that was a huge revolution, not in the sense uh, of code, but in the general sense of really uh, drastically changing the way uh, humanity looked at the sky. What Newton said, what Newton uh, in a way postulated, was that there was a force capable of attracting masses uh, towards one another. And that force, as we know, is proportional to masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the masses. But central to Newton's paradigm was the existence of a force. Now, Newton, Newton himself was not entirely satisfied with this idea of the force, because he thought that it was a force unlike any other normal. He, it acted at a distance. He didn't need the masses to touch one another. It acted uh, apparently instantaneously. Whatever the distance between planets, stars, it acted uh, nonetheless instantaneously. And, and so Newton was not satisfied. He wished he could explain what kind of force this was, but he couldn't. Have any chance to do that. Nonetheless, Newton's views were accepted for more than two centuries and contributed greatly to the, um, to the development of astronomy, which really uh, had an explosion of new knowledge after Newton, and, uh, and in part due to the ability to calculate the motions of the uh, celestial objects. Even nowadays, we still, for most calculations, use Newton's laws rather than what's dictated by the new paradigm which took place in the beginning of last century when Albert Einstein devised his uh, general uh, uh, relativity theory. Now, I don't know if you are familiar with Einstein's view. According to who? There is no force. There is no gravitational force. What in fact we call a force, what we perceive as a force, is a deformation of space and time caused by the presence of now, uh, this may be uh, difficult to understand. As, as we mentioned in the, uh, in the last lesson, when we talked about theories, theories are often uh, surprising. The first time one hears a theory, uh, it is hard to believe, or it's really amazing, because it has an incredible power of explaining nature, and at the same time is often outside our intuition. So, what did that, uh, Einstein say? He said that the empty space is basically flat, or if you prefer, is uh, it's like the space we usually conceive, the Euclidean space. Whenever you have some mass in space, as it is shown here, space is deformed by the mass. The more the, the, the more the space is close to the mass, the more it is deformed. Time is also deformed by the mass. And that's more, more difficult to appreciate. Let's talk about space mostly. Einstein says a planet rotates. Uh, orbits around the star, 
not because there is a force that attracts you to the star, but because it is moving linearly, although it doesn't appear to do so. It is moving linearly as if the space here represented in this warped way were flat. Now, the usual, uh, the usual uh, uh, metaphor that one uses to explain this concept is this. Imagine you are a small animal, and you are walking on a white sheet which is well tense, well, we are keeping this sheet tense, so it's entirely flat. The ant, the ant walks linearly. Now, let's suppose that uh, unknowing the ant, we put a weight in the middle of the sheet. So now, of course, we have a bond in the middle of the sheet. We have a balance. The ant is forced to walk around this balance. But she still will perceive the vision that she's walking straight. This will be simply the shortest walk that's, that the ant can do. It cannot do like this. There is no space here. This is not empty. There is simply not even space. Even more than an ant. Suppose, again, you have this sheet, perfectly flat, you have a small bead, you kick it, and it goes straight. Suppose now you have a wave in the middle of the ship, same kick, same force, same impulse to the bead, now the bead goes around the valley, and perhaps that is a circular or an entire orbit around the force and distance, etc. So this works in the three dimensional space and even in the four-dimensional space-time, according to us. And this is our current paradigm of, uh, of uh, gravitation, space, and time. Although some physicists are, are attempting to find alternative models, but this is by far the dominant one. So, we understand that this is a very radical shift. First, we have a force. Now, we have no force. And we have something we have never conceived before, which is deforming space it is itself, not to mention time. Really, it's the only More. In the field of chemistry. This is John Dalton, who in the 18th century was interested in the, in the basis of, uh, of the chemistry of gases. In fact, he started from uh, uh, studying the atmosphere, the, the atmospheric phenomena. And because of that, he was interested in gases, and because he was interested in gases, he shifted to chemistry. So he had an interesting. Uh, shifting his own interest in scientific interest. He was a very, very accurate scientist. Uh, and at the time, chemistry was just a, uh, you know, a very uh, superficial science which uh, attempted to explain uh, some chemical phenomena by a vague affinity field. Chemistry postulated that some, stuff, some substances have affinity for one another, and some others do not. When they have an affinity, they can combine with themselves. If they don't, they're not separated, even despite our attempts to mix them. And so according to this vague notion of affinity, you could explain nearly everything or nothing, but really make very few, if any, predictions about how uh, substances would, uh, would behave if mixed together in different conditions. 
basically uh, chemistry was a uh, collection of recipes, like a cookbook. Uh, chemists at the, at the time knew that if they mixed certain substances in some ways, they obtained different compounds. That's all they knew. Bolton reproduced some of these recipes uh, in a very accurate way. And he confirmed that if you mix carbon and oxygen in a certain way, you obtain what was called what we now call carbon dioxide. And in this case, 72% of the compound is made of oxygen. If you mix carbon and oxygen in another way, you obtain carbon dioxide, monoxide in which oxygen represents only 57%. Now, put this way, this, these uh, reactions really convey no specific ideas about, about what is going on. But John Dalton had the idea of putting the results in a different way, to look at different view, and said, OK, if we have one gram of carbon, Let's see how many grams of oxygen are required to obtain carbon dioxide and carbon oxide. And he obtained exactly 2.66 and 1.33. Point. So, what's obvious about this? It's a number. Right. <coughs> One number is double the other. Now, the magic is how Dalton interpreted these numbers. From these and other similar experiments, he concluded that atoms combine in whole numbers. They don't mix in a variable way. They can mix just in a proportion of 1 to 1, 1 to 2, 1 to 3, etc. So, because chemistry had to deal now with whole numbers, these whole numbers perhaps represented atoms and the ability of atoms to combine with one another. So, he postulated the existence of atoms, which were the basis of, of the whole science of chemistry, without, of course, having any physical proof of the existence of atoms, without of course, uh, ever having seen atoms uh, and being really way ahead of his time. This was a quantum jump in chemistry that really allowed chemistry to become a mature science and then evolve. So, this was another major shift from a vague affinity theory to a modern. Once again, notice that the observations stay the same. Carbon dioxide and oxide were the same before and after, after Dalton. The difference is the way we interpret what we do and the observations we make. One final example. This is Pierre Simon Laplace, who, in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, wrote a book. In the preface of the book, uh, he was a mathematician, a mathematician, a physicist, a uh, philosopher, uh, very famous in his time, still famous. Uh, and in the preface of his book, he wrote a very famous sentence, which is a bit difficult to understand, but he will, I, I'll explain what means. Let's see what, it's, what he said. He said, we may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future. An intellect, often called Laplace demon, an intellect which at a certain moment will know all forces that set nature in motion and all positions of all items of which nature is composed 
if this intellect were also vast enough to submit these data to analysis, it would embrace in a single formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the tiniest atom. For such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain, and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. So, what is Laplace saying here? He says basically the universe is like uh, a billiard thing. There are objects, like the balls on the table, and there are forces that act on the objects. Everything that happens on the table is dictated by the forces that act on the objects. All is predictable, much as a really uh, uh, player can predict for a long time where it will to uh, will end up after bumping here and there several times. So he says, if we had an immense intellect capable of knowing in a given instant of the universe where are the uh, items that compose the, the universe from the largest stars to the smallest atom, uh, atoms if we knew all the forces that act on that we, we would be able to calculate retrospectively all the paths and we would be able to predict again by calculation prospectively all the future This goes under the name causal determinism, which means everything is defined by precise rules and in principle can be predicted or retro predicted. If we look at this. Now, uh, this is very satisfactory because it is a concept that embraces the whole view. And also poses no limit to the ability of humans to understand the universe. The only limit is our ability to know forces and, and items in the universe and calculate the effects of those forces on the universe. On the other hand, it poses problems, uh, uh, philosophical problems, when we think of the uh, free will, the ability to decide that we support the to, to make decisions about our actions. And if everything is determined, including whatever our neurons, the atoms that make up our neurons, is calculatable, then we have no choice. And we simply think we have a choice. Nonetheless, this was the way people thought. And I remember when I was must have been like 12 years old. I have a good intuitive idea of classical physics and no idea of quantum physics. And when I saw this sentence, I said, of course it's natural, of course it is like this. But in fact, we don't think it is like this. Because then came a Werner Heisenberg, who, you know, Early in the 20th century, established the the uh, it's a terrible thing. <laughs> the uh, indetermination principle. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, according to this principle, it is impossible to determine at the same time the momentum, basically the speed of uh, is a particle, a particle, without particle definition, and its precise position in space. You can determine precisely either of these parameters, but not both of them at the same time. So there is always an uncertainty. You must accept this uncertainty. This is not due to uh, some fault of our instruments. It's not technical. It's inherent in nature. We cannot possibly know according to the principle what 
what's the speed, what's the precise position of bodies. Interestingly, physicists are accumulating uh, observations which apply to objects larger than atomic or subatomic particles. So it seems that the same principle applies to relatively microscopic objects such as molecules or even larger objects. So the determinism that was central to Laplace thinking that is described by Bernard uh, Heisenberg, and again it was a major paradigm shift. Now we can no longer calculate the future or the past in a precise way. Good, so I hope this illustrates what a paradigm is. Once again, here, uh, both Laplace and Heisenberg were dealing with similar observations. Of course, Laplace didn't have atoms in his hand, but they were still dealing with the frame of the universe. But they looked at it in a different way. Laplace was entirely deterministic. He thought he knew the real uh, composition of the universe, and that was made of objects and bodies, nothing else. Heisenberg says, doesn't really say what the universe is made of, but he says that you cannot calculate the way that class proposed, you cannot calculate exactly what, we, what the universe will be in any future. So, with these examples, I think we... I ask you if you have understood the, the concept that a paradigm is not an observation itself, it's not a law of science, uh, it is a way of looking at the world the way of looking at the observations in science and determining. And paradigms can and do change. Kuhn draws a, uh, a parallel with famous uh, uh, psychological experiments of his time. He says, well, a paradigm works in a way uh, that forces scientists to think in a certain way, to think along the lines of the paradigm itself. It is difficult to think outside the box, as we would say today. It is difficult to think in a way that the paradigm that contrasts with the, with, with the view of the paradigm. First psychological experiment that he uh, thinks uh, looks like uh, the way a paradigm forces uh, scientists to think. I'll try to replicate this experiment here. Let's see what happens. Okay, the paradigm is a new point of view. So let's say I show you a card for a brief time, and then I ask you, what is it? What, what was it? You can say it in Italian because I don't know how to say it in English. No, in Italian. All right. Now I'll show you another card. Oops. <laughs> no, thank you. Another time. Okay. A little Not so much of a bit. Not this boy. Not this boy. What's the point here? You, of course, did not expect hearts to be black. So you interpreted the hearts as pink again. Right. 
And in the actual experiment that was run at the time, uh, people were, sh were being shown cards on a computer screen for very, very short periods of time, tens of milliseconds. It was easy for them to recognize regular cards. But in order to recognize a card like this, it, they, it took much longer time. And some people would never recognize a card such as this, but they would simply answer, I don't know, I'm confused, I don't, I don't seem to recognize anything. Why? Because they were stuck to the paradigm. And so are scientists. For most scientists, it's incredibly hard to detach from the current paradigm. In fact, and we'll come back to this later, scientists often resist the paradigm shift, which is sort of surprising. Another experiment that I could mention is what happens if you put inverting, inverted, uh, inverted glasses uh, on a person. Initially, that person sees the world upside down. Now, now that's very uncertain. Try to walk with this glass, you, you fall instantly. Uh, perhaps uh, those of you who wear glasses and experience something like that the first time in life, they yeah. wear glasses. Uh, not, like, uh, not like this, of course. Yeah. But you know, an instant yeah. really, the ground looks closer or more distant uh, or, or, or upside down. It's a, yeah. You know, uh, really things you have to adapt to. What's interesting is that after a while, like a time between half an hour to a few hours, people adapt to glasses and now the world is again in the upright position. After that, they are able to see things in the proper position, whether they wear the glasses or not. Their brain has, has learned how to interpret the signals, whether the glasses are on or not. Which is pretty amazing. So again, Kuhn here says, a crisis is like this. You wear the glasses for the first, for the first time, and, and really, you don't understand the world anymore. You're upset. You don't have certainties anymore. But then, after a while, you adapt. Imagine you are the scientist now. After a while, you adapt. And then, again, the world makes sense. This is a paradigm shift. This is how a scientist typically goes through a crisis. With uh, the time of uh, loss of orientation and then again coming back to the senses. Alright, so uh, we have shown a few examples of paradigm shift. But again, Kuhn uh, goes more in depth, uh, citing uh, historical, uh, historical paradigm shifts. And here are a few other examples. This person here is William Herschel, a very, very famous uh, astronomer, who discovered the first uh, uh, planet in the solar system not visible to the naked eye. What he did was, To look at the sky night after night at the same time, which is typically what astronomers, astronomers do, and he noticed that there was a small object, this one, that within a few nights shifted to another position. That was not a fixed star, as they were called. Fixed stars are basically stars so distant from us, most of the time, uh, that we cannot see them shift, even though the Earth moves quite a lot. So, so that was a paradigm shift in the sense that even in this time, people thought maybe all the stars were fixed. And so it was surprising to see something that did not behave like a star. 
In fact, possibly one paradigm not mentioned by Kuhn was that people uh, people thought that the planets were only the ones we had always been accustomed to see. Since antiquity, people knew that there were five planets besides them. Five planets besides And now a new one appears. It, is, it was so surprising that Herschel himself thought it was a comet, not a planet. But then other astronomers followed it and quickly understood that it was the first planet, Uranus, uh, that, was, uh, that was not visible to the naked eye. The paradigm shift that uh, Kuhn mentioned was the understanding that one should look for moving objects, which astronomers at the time didn't have. Now, once Herschel had shown that some of this would move, was a big move, then he looked for those objects and quickly uh, found several asteroids and other objects uh, that had escaped for centuries uh, their attention. <coughs> now, just to make a minor point, uh, it looks easy here to see a shifting object. But Herschel didn't have photographs. He did all this by naked eye. So he was drawing the sky night after night, and nobody could do this tiny point was shifting in the sky. So quite a few. All right. Another example. Very glaring example of what a paradigm can do uh, and how a paradigm can really uh, skew or can really bias the way scientists look at nature. Here is a uh, record uh, from Chinese uh, astro astronomical archives. It says, from the fifth month of the first year of the Zihi Kingdom. Which corresponds to July the 4th, 1054. From east, a new star appeared not far from the Ping Wan star. This star was consumed with, it, with time, and nowadays it has disappeared. What was that? Do you know what, what was it? What is a star that appears very bright in the sky and then disappears? Orbit. No, they knew comets and it wasn't comets. It's what we call a nova. Nova means still a nova. What is a nova? It's a star that explodes. When it explodes for a few weeks to a few months, it emits so much light that it's brighter at times than even a whole galaxy. So it's an immense amount. This particular nova, we can calculate that, was so bright that it was visible during daylight. So it was very, very obvious to everybody. You didn't have to be an, ast an astronomer to see that there was something new in the sky. And yet, in the Western records, there is nothing about that. Why was that? Because we were under the Aristotelic uh, uh, paradigm. Aristotle said that the skies are immutable, that they reflect the perfection of God in the church's interpretation, and so nothing would change. Because God is perfect and the sky is perfect as well. And so it was impossible for it to start to appear and disappear. So it must have been something else, something not even worth knowing. Now, I'm not sure this is really true. This was a real uh, Kuhn at times was rather, was rather naive with the history of science. Uh, but nonetheless, it is impressive that this star was never. By the way, this is the remnant of the explosion. This is the Crab Nebula. And the star is still visible somewhere. What remains of the star? 
Alright, so let's go back to another paradigm which we have already considered. The shift between the geocentric and the heliocentric paradigm. Now, Copernicus was not the first to propose that the sun was in the middle of the solar system of the universe. Now, he in fact understood that well. But at the time it was very, very dangerous to, to say such a thing because the church was very serious about, uh, about the astronomy. Uh, and so, uh, first of all, he published, he published his book uh, when he was already on his death, but such he died a few days after publishing his book. And to be safer, the publisher had a preface to the book which said, you know, we do not pretend the sun is in the middle of the universe. It's just a, uh, an, a, a way to, to make calculations easier. Look how easy it is to do calculations if we assume, if we, if we uh, pretend that the sun is in the middle of the universe, which of course it is not. So anyway, uh, as I said, Copernicus was not the first to think that the sun was in the middle of the universe. The first one to propose such an idea was Aristarchus of Samos, uh, about uh, uh, three centuries before Christ. Aristarchus was able to calculate the radius of the moon, the radius of the sun, and the distance between the earth and the and the Earth and the Sun. And if you would like to know how he did, how an ancient Greek could do that without any optical instruments, I'll be glad to tell you after the lesson of the lesson of astronomy. It's an amazing feat of uh, geometry and trigonometry. And ingenuity, most important. The, the trigonometry today is absolutely trivial. It's a student's senior high school students uh, but, but the, the concepts uh, were important. So Aristarchus saw that the sun was much, much larger. In fact, he underestimated the dimensions of the sun. But nonetheless, he saw it, it was much, much larger than the Earth and the Moon. And so he proposed that it made more sense to put the sun in the of the universe than the Earth. Was a conjecture. He had not, didn't have the tools to demonstrate that that was true, but he did make that proposal. But then his proposal was not accepted and was essentially forgotten. Why was that? According to Kuhn, because there was no crisis, because there were no observations that were in contrast with the more intuitive easy to accept paradigm that we are still the, mid, the, the, the earth in the middle of the life of the universe and everything else circles around the earth. This is what our senses suggest, although it is not true. And so, although this proposal was correct, it was rejected and forgotten until, here again, who underlines this uh, reason why the crisis of course. At some point, observations accumulated which were not reconcilable with this paradigm. You see, it's the only one that is done. No, that's okay. How about you? What were these observations? Well, there were several, but the most striking one was the so called retrograde motion of planets. Most visible uh, with Mars. The retrograde motion of planets is a phenomenon according to which if you look at a planet night after night at the same time, you see the planet moving along its orbit. 
so you'll see it more through the sky. And it should move always in the same direction. One at times, instead, it looks like this. First it goes back, and then it takes again the original. Now, this is very difficult to explain if you think the Earth is in the middle of the universe. In fact, the Ptolemaics uh, had to resort to uh, various uh, strategies to try to explain this phenomenon. They thought, well, first of all, uh, because planets and the sky in general are perfect reflection of God, certainly the orbits must be certain. Uh, but the circular orbit of, of say, Mars or another, planet, or another planet around the Earth would uh, not explain the retrograde motion. So they, say, they said, well, uh, in fact, the planet is circling a point, a virtual point, which circles around the Earth. So that explains why the planet appeared to go back in the But then again, uh, if they, when they did more accurate observation, the model did not explain the observation, not fit the observation. So Ptolemy said, well, okay, we have a circle that goes around a circle that goes around the Earth. And so at some point, to explain all the motions of the planet, of the planets they had, these are called AP cycles, these circles, these virtual circles. They had 52 AP cycles, and still they could not really explain perfectly the observation. So clearly there were the paradigm did not fit the observations of the paper. So because there was a crisis, uh, even though it was disputed uh, strongly by the church, eventually Copernicus used to accept it had to be accepted. So how do we explain retrograde motion in fact? What, what is the real phenomenon? Here it is. If you have the sun in the middle of the solar system, we now know that Earth goes around the sun faster than Mars. So, in general, uh, the closer a planet is to the sun, the faster it is in its own. So, you, when you look at Mars, you are, you are in fact projecting the image of Mars on the background of the sky. And so you can see that this projection, when the, when the Earth passes Mars, because it's faster, because the Earth is faster, this projection appears to go back, and then it starts to go in the direction. It's similar to the phenomenon that you see from a fast running train when looking at cars that run along the same, in the same direction. It appears that the cars go back, but in fact, of course, we don't, we know it is not true. Because we, we measure the movement, that we instinctively measure the movement, evaluate the movement of the cars against the background, the distance, the background, say, the mountains, the trees, or the earth. So it appears that the, the time goes back. The, a similar phenomenon happens with Mars and all planets, and we have an apparent, an apparent uh, record of motion. So, again, here uh, it shows that the retrograde motion was known very well before the Berkeley's, but once it was served in sufficient detail, uh, it created a crisis uh, within the existing, with the existing paradigm, and, uh, uh, and required in the And the observations didn't change at all. The reservation, uh, the reservation motion stood the same. It was our interpretation of the No more epicycles, a simple phenomenon like this. The Earth passes Mars. That's it. Good. What are the consequences? I, I hope now it is clear what uh, who means by paradigm. 
what are the consequences of Kuhn's thinking? Well, first of all, he says acceptance of a new paradigm is partially subjective. Basically, there is no criteria to determine that the paradigm is correct. At some point, the scientific community decides that they agree on a given paradigm because it makes sense, because it accommodates non data. And so, eventually, we come to the conclusion that scientific truth is what the scientific community agrees on, which is, again, sort of very relativistic in a way. But it's not. Kuhn was not a relativist. He really felt that there was nothing above the scientific community. Scientists makes lot, make a lot of mistakes, but there is nobody above the scientists to explain science, to think, to explain science. So whatever scientists agree on is the best we can do with it. That explains also this, this partial subjectivity. This sociology of science explains why paradigms change every once in a while. But Kuhn says, notice historically, that scientists really resist paradigm shift. He tries to explain this uh, appearance in Congress. Wait a second. Why is it in Congress? One, one would expect naively that a scientist who always looks for new things, new observations, new laws of nature, would welcome a paradigm shift. But scientists really usually do not. They strongly resist the paradigm. And according to whom, this is because of the way they have been trained. Now, a young scientist being trained in this new stuff is trained on textbooks. Textbooks basically convey a snapshot of the current paradigm, of the current view of the subject. They do not provide history or a historical perspective. Not because they are bad books, but because it would be too difficult to explain science and the history of the science, plus all the mistakes happen during the history of the science. So textbooks are forced to, uh, as I said, give you a snapshot of what's current. That is, including, of course, and foremost, the current paradigm. And so the young child and the young scientist is like a, a young child to whom which you can make believe almost anything. You take a very young child, you telling them the most horrible thing is beautiful, it's great, it's gorgeous, it's funny. And he would believe it. Same thing for the scientist. His first approach to science is that in the textbook, and that becomes basically a postulate, something that should be uh, doubted. That's why, according to Kuhn, scientists are really resistant to paradigm shift. That's why in history they have resisted paradigm shift. Now, I may add something on my own, underscoring that this is my own thinking and not good. In fact, it is not entirely true that scientists resist paradigm shifts. They resist paradigm shifts in their own area, not in other areas of science. And that's more understandable on uh, a, psycho a psychological ground. Think of you, say, 20, 30 years from now, you have been, have gone through your own career, having you know, 
some points, some cardinal points for reference. They really guided on your studies, on your thinking, on your efforts, the time, the, 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 the money, the, the efforts that you spent in science. At some point, somebody tells you, well, you know, this is not true, it's different. It's not the way you have thought for 30 years. Wouldn't you resist? I think you would. Then eventually you would accept if you're if you're objective enough, but it would take an effort on that side. <clears throat> All right, so we have talked about two giants uh, of epistemology in the 20th century, Poole and Popper. Now, historically, they have fought each other, academically. Uh, the ideas of uh, one were pitched against the ideas of the other uh, by the followers. And it is interesting that people in North America were poor operating in the European world, uh, mostly follow Kuhn's thinking, and people in, in, in Europe uh, mostly follow Popper's thinking, which is another way to show that in philosophy well as in science, it is not objectivity alone that, that really uh, decides what's good and what's not. But anyway, uh, I think that uh, rather than being uh, opposite to each other, uh, these two philosophers are complementary. On one side, Popper gives us a logical purely logical, totally abstract idea of science. He has told us that we can never prove a theory. We can only disprove it. So that the theory remains forever questionable, doubtable. And this is on the logical abstract ground. On the other hand, Kuhn dirties his hands with psychology, with sociology, most important of science, with history of science, and finds what really goes on in science itself and tells us what we have talked about today. So in my opinion, uh, their ideas are really complicated. One complement the other. Alright, so are there any comments or questions on this? I mean, agree more with you. You agree with Kuhn? Yeah, it, it's, it's more. We proper science is more. Uh, I understand. Uh, Kuhn, first of all, gives you a more realistic picture of science. Uh, and on the other hand, the examples are attractive and, and, and agreeable. Uh, by the way, I have a counterexample to do it also, since, since you mentioned this. When we talked about, let's go back a little OK. When we talked about the paradigm shift between neurons and Einstein, in fact, there was no practice. Of course, there were unexplored areas of physics. There, there are today areas of physics that are not understood. There will always be. But there was no crisis. Uh, Newton's laws worked perfectly well. With, with very tiny exceptions. There was a, uh, the motion of Mercury showed uh, abnormalities, anomalies that could not be explained by People thought, well, that maybe there is a small planet that we cannot see around the, uh, around the sun, closer to the sun than Mercury itself, which modifies a little bit of the sun. But really, there was nothing, no reason to doubt, basically, uh, Newton's ideas. Uh, and in fact, it's a typical situation in which there was no accumulation. Mercury was really a tiny speck in the universe. Everything else was working perfectly well. So. There was no uh, 
serious question in the world until Einstein came and provided a new paradigm. And this paradigm indeed was sort of brilliant, but in fact not accepted by the physics community until 22 years later when he predicted a phenomenon that was completely unexplainable by the physics. Then there was a, a almost instant shift. Einstein became the most famous physicist in the world, well known even to the general people, all the scientists, because he had predicted something unthinkable. Again, if you're interested, I'll tell you. So, going back to oops, where we were. I'd like to go back to the example I provided last time concerning the, uh, the ability, the limited, uh, but clearly existent ability of cardiomyocytes. Let's look at it with the uh, Kuhn science. Kuhn would say, for 50 years or so, people have believed and uh, uh, adhered to the paradigm that cardiomyocytes are post mitotic They have lost the ability to proliferate and to die. Now, Piero Merza provided a series of observations, not a single one. Popper would say that this photograph would be enough not to destroy the theory that cardiomyocytes are, are post-mitotic. Kuhn would say, well, you have many, many pictures, and probably you need uh, replication by scientists other than the discovery before the scientific community accepts that there is a problem. Perhaps some cardiomyocytes, at least, are not postmodal. And then you have, you probably need additional uh, proofs, different experiments that converge on the same conclusion, and so on. Only then, this new notion, this new paradigm, will be accepted. And this is exactly what happened back then. Uh, and that's published uh, his first observation at the end of the 20th century, and it took a good, I would say, 10 15 years before the scientific community uniformly accepted that the cardiomyocytes can be like And so, is it possible that in 50 years or more, nobody had observed what Anversa did? That is not realistic. So, scores, dozens, hundreds, thousands of scientists, of pathologists uh, must have seen cardiomyocytes figures like this. Cardiomyocytes like. But they must have been blinded by the current paradigm. They must have thought, well, it's another cardiomyocyte. Other cells, and perhaps overlapped the cardiomyocytes and increased this indeed. Or they even thought it's impossible. It's, but it's well known that this is not possible, so there is something wrong here. Yeah. Throw away the slide. Or they might have said, well, this is a, an extremely rare exception. Perhaps this cell is, uh, is diseased, is, uh, is mutated, it's something, but it's not a real cardiomyocyte. So, so, like the, the Nova star, they had ignored the evidence with no other explanation because they were blinded by the paradigm. Now, the paradigm is not something we need a paradigm. We need a way to explain our observations, otherwise, we would have a collection of data that alone don't mean anything. We need a way to explain our discourse, to explain our observations. And so we cannot do science without paradigms, but we should strive to consider paradigms temporary. 
and to consider the possibility that what we are observing is true despite the kind of problem. And that's, as I think I've shown, it's very, very good. One thing I've mentioned is that perhaps before accepting the new paradigm, the scientific community uh, may have requested uh, more evidence other than static pictures such as these, which, you know, with some difficulty you might explain away by claiming that there are some artifacts or that perhaps this is not really a reflection of what happens. The, uh, ways to eliminate almost any kind of observation that you really want. But there were then uh, other uh, pieces of evidence that really made the point and, and that made the paradigm shift unavoidable. I'd like to show you one of these that was particularly admirable uh, in the way it was, uh, it was done. This person <coughs> here, uh, Jonas Frizen, the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm devised this new method uh, that first he applied to neurons to show that neurons really do not divide during the lifetime. And then later applied in this paper here, applied to cardiomyocytes. He said, within a cell, what is the most long-lived model? What do you think? The carbon. Molecule. Molecule. Macro molecule. Biochemical molecule. Longest lives. The longest lived. Longest lived. It's easy. It's easy. Just think about it. DNA. DNA. DNA, especially in a non divided cell, survives as long as the cell itself. Okay, so he thought, let's, let's look at the DNA record in cardiomyocytes and see indirect but highly convincing evidence that they divide. Okay, how did they do it? He considered that in uh, uh, during this period here, between the mid 50s and mid 60s of the last century, there was a sharp increase in the amount of uh, carbon 14 in the atmosphere. That was due to uh, atomic bomb experiments in the atmosphere. In the mid 60s, actually, I think it was in so, uh, these experiments were, uh, were outlawed worldwide. So, there were no more uh, atomic experiments in the atmosphere underground. So there was no further great release of, of carbon 14 in the atmosphere. And then the carbon 14, carbon 14 uh, began to uh, go down fairly quickly. And that was not because it disappeared, because the half life, the physical half life of carbon. About 6,000 something years. Uh, the reason was because it dissolved in the oceans, so it was no longer in the atmosphere. And so, Frizen uh, reasoned the way an archaeologist or a paleontologist uh, would do it. said, well, if you weren't born, say, in this year, when I was legal with carbon. Your DNA, the DNA of your cardiomyocyte, must have incorporated lower amounts of carbon 14. And then, if you never uh, replicated DNA, because there was no cardiomyocyte region, then the content of carbon 14 must have been the same. But instead, we found that people born in the easier, and then that later, during, after the peak, they had an increase in the amount of carbon 14. And vice versa, people born here, who died here, 
and the tree is covered. That is kind of very much as then predicted by the time of the birth. And so by a variety of observations like this, it really pinned the point that target analysis group divide and was also able to calculate the figure that I did in the last lesson. That is, uh, according to these calculations, which are widely accepted, uh, the cardiomyocytes divide so rarely that only half of all the cardiomyocytes have replaced the whole life cycle. And this is it. Uh, I guess the question is how much we can science in the world. Yeah, it's a great argument for Tina, not an argument, but I'm going to this question, a topic. And she said, I do not trust science, not because science is profitable, but because I saw how people do science, and so I do not trust. And it was just funny. It's an interesting point of view, and uh, it is worth considering. Of course, when I asked uh, how much we trust science, I was thinking of, of, of good science. Of course. Of course, <laughs> science is not all good. Yeah. And there is a lot of uh, manipulation. There is a lot, unfortunately, of. Uh, of uh, of poor practice in science, not to talk about fraud, which is also present in science, uh, which really contaminate a lot of science. And at times, it is difficult to distinguish what's true and what's not. And we talk about, uh, by the end of the course, when we discuss the ethics of science. We talk about fraud, we talk about Honest mistakes and dishonest alterations of the data. That's fun to share. Yeah. Because I was hoping to transfer, like, the one we heard from me and Nicole. And uh, she said that, okay, but that's a good point. What's her background? Uh, molecular biology. Oh, yeah. 